so hi everybody. Um, excuse me while I nearly knock that off. So I'm James. I'm a Linux engineer with the SRE team working for Betfair down in Hammersmith. And I'm here today to talk about metrics. In a slight change from the rest of the talk, I will actually be talking about a couple of the tools that we use here. Now, a couple of things to start with. One, this talk normally lasts about half an hour or so. And I'm aware I'm the last person between you and beer. So I'll rush through a couple of bits fairly quickly. And if you've got any questions at the end, come and find me near the bar. Um, very quickly through this, for anybody who's not aware, Betfair is, unsurprisingly, a gambling company. Um, I would run through all of this, but my boss isn't here, so he's not going to see it. I don't care. What I'm actually going to be talking about is the line near the bottom where it says that our monetary system is currently tracking about 100,000 different metrics every second. And what I'm here to do today is explain how we do that. And that's with a combination of two tools. Um, one is OpenTSDB, and the other one is OpenTSP. Quick show of hands, how many people here are familiar or have heard of OpenTSDB? And how many of you use it? Uh, and how many of you have tried to alert off it and failed? Um, and how many people have heard of OpenTSP? It's a trick question. That's um, an open source tool that we've just released to fix the problems that we've seen with OpenTSDB. So where to start? The obvious place, given how few hands went up, is what is OpenTSDB? Well, so that was the first implementation of OpenTSDB at Betfair. And this predates my joining. This was about three years ago, apparently. I'm reliably informed that that survived four desk moves. And yes, the little poster on it does say, don't unplug this. <laughs> in a nutshell, though, in as you might imagine from the name, it's one of the inspired naming schemes that the IT industry comes up with, it is a time series database. It's a database which is optimized for storing and querying time series metrics. And in TSDB's case, they come, they look like this. You have the metric name, you have a Unix timestamp, you have the value for the metric, and then there's a set of additional tag and value pairs that we can use to do um, some more detailed analysis of. So I'll run you through quickly the architecture as we use it at Betfair a quick story about how we use it to do our troubleshooting, and then I'll start going through um, where we ran into problems and what we've done to fix them. So at its heart, OpenTSDB is basically an H-based database sitting on a, an HDFS cluster. Um, ours at the moment is running on now six data nodes and about 40 terabytes of storage. Um, we've got three front-end servers in front of that that do reads and writes to it. The whole thing is sat behind a load balancer and metrics go in, and queries go in and come back out. And that's the, the, the central part of TSDB. But a database is only as useful as how well you can get the data in and out. Um, TSDB comes with a number of different ways to get the data out. The first one is the, um, the query tool that came with it, which looks a bit like this. You can see you can um, put in the metric name, the host that you want, and it produces you a shiny little graph. It's fairly simple. The problem with the, the fundamental problem that we found with this is there is absolutely no way to search for the metrics. So we're collecting um, rough estimate around about a million different streams. You have to know exactly what you're looking for. That's not really that handy. The next one is a tool called Metrolix, which the, um, the guys at Ticketmaster wrote and open sourced. Again. These are basic, fundamentally, tools to produce nice, shiny graphs. But this one comes with, you can't really see it on the screen, a nice um, search for the metric name. And then the one that we use more often, we call the visualizer. This is an internal one that we've, we've written. This has a lot more functionality. But again, at the end of the day, it's producing a graph. Everybody loves graphs. Um, and then the final part of the story is how you get data into it. So here's to be comes with. Um, this plugin that they call T Collector, which sits on all of the boxes that you want to monitor, watches a directory on that box, runs plugins it finds there, which gather metrics, write them to stand it out, and then it ships them across to TSDB. Um, it comes by default with a set of plugins that we refer to as Collect OS, so they collect all of your basic um, OS metrics, so CPU, memory, disk space, everything that you could possibly imagine. And we have a set that we call Collect JMX because we are internally a fairly big Java house. And so all our devs expose all of the metrics that they want through the beans in their Java. And we've got 
stuff that collects that and runs into it. And of course, that runs on all of the, the servers that we've got. So what we primarily use TSDB for at the moment is troubleshooting and root cause analysis. And I'll run through a quick example of that at the moment. It's really useful for that. And when I say performance analysis, I mean, we've got instances in our dev environment. And when our devs write new release to their code, they run it through all of this for um, performance testing. So to move on quickly to oh, my beer, <laughs> to the story of using it. So this, this all takes place um, during Cheltenham week, during the week of the, the Cheltenham Racing Festival this year, which, as you might imagine, is quite a busy time for a gambling company. And people started coming up to me and saying, TSDB is running a bit slow. Is there something wrong with it? Which is everybody's favorite bug report. It's a bit slow. So fortunately, we had metrics to show it. So this, um, this taken from HA proxy, which is what's serving up the front end of our visualizer, this is the average response time in milliseconds. And those aren't really numbers that you like. It's taking 30 seconds to return. Um, this is a problem. So we immediately start thinking about, OK, what might be causing it? It's Cheltenham week. It's all really busy. Maybe people are using it a lot. Maybe it's just a load thing. So we looked at, and forgive the fact that the colors have changed, but the big purple one now is the same measure that we were just looking at. And the green line that you can see sort of along the bottom is the rate at which those requests are coming in. And it's really easy to test a hypothesis. There's no correlation between them. It's not that. Um, we looked through a couple of other bits. We looked at CPU load and all of that, and there's no correlation with them. The next clue came with this one. So you can see there's two graphs which look very screwy and the same, and you might be able to see there's one along the bottom that's quite flat. So one of them is the visualizer request rate. The one that looks exactly the same is the request rate for the people using Metrolix. And the one along the bottom um, I'll explain exactly what it is in a bit, but fundamentally it's web requests to the same server that does visualize and Metrolix, but it's not querying the underlying database. So that immediately points to this is an H-based problem of some sort. And then we came across this. So this is um, the write requests count for the four, at the time we had four data nodes. And as you can see, it goes a bit weird, which is the official technical term. Um, if I was explaining it to lay people, I'd talk about things like hotspotting and unbalanced regions, but I think we get technical terms. It goes a bit weird. And just to really rub it in, if you can look at those and not say they're correlated, um, and as it turns out, yeah, um, we were near, H base was nearly full. Um, it was badly balanced because it had been running for three years without anybody who really knew a lot about H base looking at it. Um, so we fixed that, we added a couple of new data nodes, and this is what it looks like now. So the green one is the same request rate two weeks later, and if you ignore the bits between about half nine and 10, that was a different problem. And the purple one is the baseline from two weeks before of what we had. So problem gone. And it's, it's tricky troubleshooting a problem in a tool if you have to use that tool to do it, but once that's all fixed, this is really useful. And so, as with tools like this, um, once it starts getting popular, as it did, people start trying to see what else they can possibly use it for. And the obvious one, our ops guys started trying to use it for monitoring and alerting. And that runs into a couple of issues. One is just pure um, query load on the TSDB backend. If people are using it for all of their dashboards and querying it every few seconds for this, that's not good. The other more pressing problem is the a data recency issue. So there is something, and I'm not an HBase expert, I'm not gonna try and get into the details, but there's something about the underlying HBase which means that the last five or 10 minutes of data doesn't always show up when you query it. Um, it's in there, but sometimes it doesn't come, and you get graphs that look like that. And that, it's very easy to explain to an ops guy or somebody at the end that yes, occasionally, TSDB produces graphs like that, that's just a, an artifact of how it works. Don't worry about it. Easy to explain that to a person. Not quite so good if you want to automate doing your alerting of it. Um, and they thought about waiting for the, the reliable thing, but 10 minutes is too long to wait if you want to alert. 
So this is the point at which my predecessors decided to write TSP. So TSP, in yet another one of those inspired naming things, stands for Time Series Pipeline. Um, we had a couple of people in the office who want to call it Bernard for some reason, but they're weird and we don't talk about them. Um, Open TSP is, this is the collection of um, components to produce this pipeline, which we use to gather the metrics and ship them wherever we want. And the first one is what we call the forwarder. So the sharp-eyed amongst you, all those I haven't put to sleep yet, will notice that you've seen something that looked very similar to this a few minutes ago. It just says forwarder instead of t-collector. And that was a very deliberate decision. It, will, it needed to be a drop-in replacement for the t-collector. So it does the same things. It sits on the, the box. It watches um, a directory. It runs the same plugins. Um, the differences come about to start with Forwarder is written in, uh, Forwarder and the whole of TSP is written in Golang, which is a really nice little language. Um, T Collector was written in Python. And while it's well written Python, it still comes with the whole of the runtime environment. And with, we're thinking about moving to containers and things like that. Something that produces nice static binaries is better. The next key difference is that the Forwarder will write the same data stream to more than one point. And this is the key to what we're doing with it. There's another couple. Um, there is some additional functionality for filtering out tags, metrics that we don't want in case there's a badly written collector, for adding new tags to all the metrics so we add the, the name of the cluster that the machine is part of. Um, and we have a new plugin for it as well. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Stats D from Etsy. Apparently, Stats E was named in homage to that. It's very similar. What Stats E does is Statsy is a way of converting event-based data, so logs or, say, web access logs, into time series data. So it aggregates it. So you have your application. Say it's a web server. Every time it serves a page, it comes back with us. So this was the response time for it. It writes that into a collect, this collect Statsy process. And then at configurable intervals, collect Statsy, does some basic um, stat stuff on it, and shoves it into forwarder where it ends up in TSDB. Um, between the application and the statsy thing, that's mediated by zero MQ to stop any back pressure affecting the application. And across a cluster of machines, we can select one, which is the statsy aggregator, which collects all of the individual metrics from all of the machines in that cluster and does that before it gets to the database. So we're aggregating everything in one instead of bit by bit and then re-aggregating it because that gives you the wrong answer. The next piece is polar. So there will be bits on your, um, in your estate that you can't run code on. So we have polar for that. Um, polar runs basically the same way as forwarder. It sits in a box. It watches a directory um, for plugins. Unsurprisingly, the plugin that does most of the heavy lifting for this is one that we call collect SNMP. But we've also got ones for F5 and NetScalers, which use the REST APIs and the HTTP to get that. And then it writes them all to wherever you want them to go. The next piece is what we call the aggregator. So unsurprisingly, it's not much use to us having several thousand different streams everywhere. What we've got is one piece that takes one of the streams from each of these. Um, again, for like Forda and Polar, it runs a plugin this one literally just listens on TCP 4242 and writes all of the metrics, it seems, to what we call the site feed. And it's this big gray arrows here, which is where we're currently seeing about 100,000 different metrics a second. And we're shipping them to six different endpoints at the moment for analysis. The next one is the controller, just to make it easier to deploy and to get um, all of your config for these various things onto the box. There's a controller. It gives you JSON. It tells you, so at the top we've got um, add some host tags to it. That's where we'd add the cluster one as well. Then there's where the log is and the collect path. And then in this case, this is two different endpoints. Um, that's fairly easy, and I'm actually doing pretty well for time. So those are the, the components that we've got, and how we put them together at Betfair is we have all of our collectors, so that's Polar and all of the, the forwarders. They talk to TSDB, that's queried by the visualizer. Now this is exactly 
the same as it was before we brought this in, and that was a very deliberate design decision because we really like TSDB. It's really useful. We didn't want to introduce more complications into that right path. But because we can do that now, they're also talk all talking to one instance of this aggregator. The whole thing is controlled by the controller. Um, but then we have a number of different places that we feed this. The first one is this, we have this little adapter that looks at um, all the tags and the host names that have come in in a metric, stores some information about that in a MySQL place, and that's how we get the search. So back on the visualizer, we could put in part of the name of a metric, and it would cut down the tags list to search from to everything that's seen that. Um, and that's just incredibly useful. Uh, we also have um, Feed Health is a little monitor script that I wrote that just does some basic checking of the whole feed. So how many are we seeing? Um, how many different hosts have we seen? How many different clusters do we know about? Have any of the hosts stopped reporting? This has actually turned out to be really useful. We've caught um, alerts because a host has stopped sending us metrics before the Nagios checks that the actual op guys who were watching that host for did. And when you can ring them up and say, shouldn't you have noticed this? They don't like that. Um, and to, for people who are familiar with it, Riemann is a stream processor. Riemann is what we're using to do our alerting and monitoring now. Um, it doesn't know anything about the state. It just looks at the last data in the field, and it can alert if anything drops below thresholds. And then we're hanging another instance of the aggregator off this and just daisy chaining it for playing with things for the future so that we can um, fix the config of those without affecting the main feed at all. And for that, um, so some of our guys in Clues have written an instance of TSDB that sits in memory on a fairly beefy box and stores the last 30 minutes of the feed. Um, the really interesting stuff that we're about to start doing is we're talking with Etsy about their anomaly detection bits. And we're gonna see if so we have a feed that's sending through, like I said, hundreds of thousands of metrics. That's too many for one person to watch. What we need is some way of plugging it all into a tool and having that tool go, oh, there might be a problem here, have a look at it. So that's the next big project. Um, and yes, this is all open sourced. So that's Forda, Snatsy, all of these bits are now open source, available under the Apache license from our GitHub page. Um, and that is me. Any questions that can't wait until I'm at the bar? <laughs> hey. Hey. Uh, why did you choose OpenTSDB over Graphite uh, as core of your solution? Um, that happened like three years before I joined Betfair, so my answer is going to be <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Anyone else? Hi, do you have any concept of collecting external metrics or are they all system-based metrics? So how do you mean by external? External visitor um, performance metrics or click paths or anything like that? Um, we've got one, mostly it's all internal stuff at the moment. Um, there's a little one that I've put together and it's a bit hacky at the moment. We've got some guys doing, so they've got a couple of um, servers in AWS that they use to do web, our website load <laughs> testing. Uh, we've got a bit that's literally, they do their testing, they write it to a file, and I've got something that SSHs out and copies it back. We will probably be doing a bit more with external metrics, but that's all we do at the moment. Got time for one more? If anyone has one. No? So thank you, James, again. Thank you.